if you're in sales, you make dreams happen for everybody, your family and the, the firm you work for, the person buying that house, like that's what we do. Hello and welcome to episode 180 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. Joining us today is founder of Improving Sales Performance and author Carl Becker. As an experienced sales professional himself, Carl shares his insights on overcoming the negative perception of sales professionals and importance of building deeper connections with clients. Introducing his book, Iceberg Selling, which focuses on going beyond surface level interactions and truly understanding clients' needs and desires, Carl provides practical steps for connecting with clients on a deeper level and shares success stories on how implementing these strategies has transformed careers. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the all-new Smart Agents Magazine has launched and is full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you will find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Subscribe now to receive your copy of the printed magazine each month and instantly get access to our online agent community and members-only templates. Click the link in the episode description or go to smartagents.com forward slash magazine. Also, if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents podcast is streaming on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and of course, YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message of feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Carl Becker. If you would like to get a copy of Iceberg Selling for Yourself, I've included a link in the episode description. Really, the way I'd like to start everything out is if you could just uh, introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are and a little bit about your background. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Carl Becker. I'm, I've been kind of a lifelong entrepreneur, somebody that's always, believe it or not, loved to sell. But I think that's because for me, selling is about connection. It's about understanding and like being a guide and helping somebody see something that they didn't before and get excited about that. So I live in Colorado, uh, near Boulder, Colorado, have for a long time, love being outside, love connecting with people, love uh, uh, just talking about sales and business and how do we make change in the world. And so I really appreciate you inviting me here to share what I do and how I think with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So just kind of, um, you know, going from the start, just tell me a little bit about what got you into the sales you know, realm and the sales business in, ge in general. Yeah. You know, sometimes you get these conversations like, are salespeople born or are they made? And my answer is going to be yes, they are both. But as a little kid, I was that little kid that if you have a neighbor like this, you drive home into your driveway and the kid comes out and goes, hey, Michael, how's your day? That was me. And I think it was because I thrived on connecting with people. I thrived on learning about what your life was like and then building off of that. And even as a little kid and, and going through school, um, I, I, as an adult, looking back, I realized that learning wasn't easy for me traditionally. Like I, I was not a good quote, classic student, you know, read this, memorize that, do that. Like that's not me. Uh, I'm a guy that needs to kind of get out and connect. And I learn from my environment. And so I think this combination of liking to connect interested in people's stories and what they wanted out of their lives. Um, and then also knowing that I needed to learn and make my way in the world by talking, getting into conversation, getting into experiences, kind of just naturally put me in this place of not only an entrepreneur, I've always had a lot of my own companies, but to me, that was just bringing ideas forward. And do you want to buy it? Great. Let, now I've got a company. And then later in life, as I developed a consultancy and I come in and with, I've got a, a team of people like me and we come in and we build sales organizations, we do coaching, we help with sales leadership. It just was natural. Um, again, for me, it was, it was the joy of learning about somebody, learning about how I might be able to help them, and then being the person that provides that solution and letting them grab onto it and move it forward. And to me, that is sales, not the stuff you see on TV or, you know, what do I need to do to get you in a car today? So like that, that's kind of my backstory. I think I just, yes, I've naturally always been curious and a sales type person, but formally over time, I've learned what works and what works for me. And I've brought that forward. So that's kind of my journey. Right. And I think a lot of those things you said there about, you know, wanting to provide uh, you know, get to know your clients and provide them with the help that they need for their particular, uh, you know, issue they may have or what they're looking to purchase. And I think, you know, when you think of real estate in our audience, that's exactly what yeah, they are sure. doing. And, 
you know, uh, over the years, there has been, been that betrayal of, you know, the real estate agents and car salesmen kind of, you know, that same mentality. But so many people I talk to, you know, they really are out there to get to know their clients and help them first. Yeah. And I would say that what you're talking about with this thing that we bring into our own heads, our own mindset, that we shouldn't be salesy or, or I'm going to come across salesy or pushy or any of these words that show up for you that make you very anxious or uncomfortable. Or maybe you've had an experience like me when I was a young kid, um, right out of college, I visited my parents and I go to this car dealership with my dad and my sister were buying a car for my sister. And the sales guy was doing a great job. He was understanding, oh, this is my sister. You know, my dad's really into safety. It's a Volvo. She's going to go off to college. Like he's he's hitting all the buttons. And then my dad looks at him and it still is like a knife in me. And he goes, well, why should I believe you? You're a sales guy. And I'm like, are you, you know, like, I'll keep it clean. Are you <laughs> kidding me? You know, and for me, I was in the financial industry at the time. I was selling securities. And that was a lot about understanding what does somebody want in retirement? What are they playing for? What was, what, why are we even talking about investing? So very similar to, you know, a professional service, like a realtor, like what, what are, what is it that you really want out of your life in this house? And I just remember leaving going, God, what a shame that just happened. What, what a shame that my dad brought that forward. And, and what did that mean to that guy? Cause he was doing a great job. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, we have to realize that that's entertainment. That's, that's kind of bullshit. That's not real. And every profession has something, you know, you're a lawyer, you know, you, you, you chase ambulances, you're a doctor, you know, oh, you're just going to upsell me this because your kid's in college and you've got a big house or whatever. Like we all have these things and I think we have to release them. And I'll tell you a really quick story about this head trash and why we, we, we got to let it go and realize sales is amazing and you make a difference. I mean, you really do. If you're in sales, you make dreams happen for everybody, your family and the, the firm you work for, person buying that house, like that's what we do. So um, I'm doing this conference in Houston. I'm talking to these early stage entrepreneurs and all day, this one guy keeps raising his hand, raising his hand and asking me questions and telling me stories. And after the the, the workshop, he comes up and he goes, do you do per personal coaching? I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, dude, I've got four hours before my flight. What, what's gone in your mind? Let's, let's sit down and talk. We start to talk and um, really powerful. Like I, I asked him, I go, can I ask you some deep questions? He goes, yeah. So all through the interaction you had with me today, you've been mentioning your father again and again and again, but the way you mention it sounds like he passed away recently. Guy gets a little choked up and he said, yeah. I said, you've also mentioned him and he was kind of a badass in business. And a couple of times you let it slip that he didn't really like salespeople. And you're telling me you have a sales problem, right? He goes, yeah. I'm kind of making the story short, mm -hmm. but I said, hey man, at the end of the day, when you sell, do you feel like you're letting your dad down? Boy, I found it fast. Yeah. And it was. I said, Tim, that's not sales, man. You know, walking into a place and telling people what they need to do and forcing things. That's not sales. That's entertainment we see on TV. That's not real. I said, you, you started your company to help people, to solve problems. Just stay in that place and ask somebody, go, hey, did you give me the opportunity to try to help you out? This is how I would do it. And just stay there and see what happens. And you know, the cool thing is over the years, he's checked in with me as company's growing and it changed his life. So we all have this baggage, whether it's from managers or how we grew up or maybe a teacher, uh, got to let it go. This is a huge profession that makes major changes and creates dreams and realities. So, um, so yeah, I, I think sales is an important thing, like you said, that sometimes we don't know what to do in it and how to be in it. But I think that 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 thought of being a guide, something that can really make a difference in lives is, is there's probably some power in there for all of us to remember. Right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that tails to the, my next kind of train of thought here and questions I want to ask you uh, for people that, you know, in real estate, I've been doing this podcast for three and a half years and I can probably count on one hand, the amount of people that entered real estate right out of college. It's a career change for them or a life change, something that something spurred them to want to make that change to real estate. Um, and I, I feel like that's, you know, also in a lot of other, um, you know, subsets of the sales industry, uh, you know, when, when people get into sales, how important is it to understand why they are personally making that change? Yeah, I think it's big time. Uh, and in my book, Iceberg Selling, I start out with a claim that I love salespeople because we make a difference. 
And then I start to invite the reader. And if I was doing a workshop or a keynote, it would be the same thing. What do you play for? Why did you choose sales? And what do you want out of your life? And it's going to be freedom, independence. I want to bet on myself. It's going to be things like that, right? And so I think the more we can remember why we why we chose to do this for ourselves um, and, and remember that every day, it, it's a way to recharge our batteries because we as salespeople are in a world where you know, our battery runs out. Whether you're the biggest extrovert in the world or you're an introvert that happens to sell and you're an exceptional listener and that's why you're an amazing salesperson. At the end of the day, most of us are worn out. We're putting ourselves out there every day. So for me, it's realizing that, you know, you probably chose this for a reason for yourself and there's something you're probably playing for. Like, what's your why? And it might be, you know, I want a better future for my children. It might be, I grew up or, and I found that I'm really good at this and I can care for my parents and I can have the things that I want. It could be anything. And, and the thing is, it's as long as it's yours and you want it and you own it, then use that as a way to fill your battery. So I do think a lot of times um, life beats us up or kind of pushes us like a river, you know, down a little stream that we didn't think we were going to. And when we can reconnect with these things, we're just, we're just better and, and it fills us up. At least that's what it does for me. Right. And then how often... You know, how important is it to um, every once in a while remind yourself yeah. of that why, or even maybe reevaluate it as your career goes on? Absolutely. I mean, I, I have one of these things where when I, I have triggers or clues, clues of the triggers that kind of put me in a bad place, right? We talked about mindset earlier and head trash. And in my case, it was my father. And in Tim's case, it was his father. So it might be one of your parents. You might be going, oh my God, this guy gets me. Or my mom was always like that, whatever it is. But um, for me, if I find that I'm agitated or I'm not, I'm worn down, there's just, I don't feel right. It's almost like you had a bad meal, you know, and you're kind of like, oh, wait, what, what's going on? I'm sluggish. Then there's probably for me a disconnect of like mission and purpose and why, and I've gotten off path. And so it can be as simple as just, just kind of looking at yourself in the mirror or just kind of calling your best friend and be like, hey, why the hell did I do this in the first place? And they're going to be like, well, remember, you're really good with people and you love helping people. And that person that you just closed that house and they're happy and the kid, da, 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 and you're like, oh yeah. And you fill yourself back up. So I, I think if you can figure out what those clues are in your own body, if you will, your own mind that puts you in a dark place, recentering on your why and realizing that you're in an amazing profession and it, it is unlimited, uh, typically, at least for me and a lot of the clients I work with, it it's that quick charge back into the battery and gets back in the game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, by being able to do that and being able to recenter yourself, that helps you get through, you know, any market dips and turns and changes, yeah. you know, it, it, it helps kind of get you back to that core reason why you initially got into the industry. Yeah. I have a hack for that too. There's a, a really good friend of mine who's been in a phenomenal salesperson his entire life. And I go, what's your secret? He goes, I go to the coffee shop every morning. Even if I'm traveling, I go to a coffee shop nearby and I can't leave until I've talked to three people. And I'm like, what? You know, like for me in the morning, like when I, if I haven't had my coffee, I don't want to talk to anybody. And, but this guy's in the camp of, if I can start my day with connection, uh, uh, the barista laughs, the person in the room next to me, I say, hey, you know, that's your kid's super cool. Like what he just said, or, you know, that's a cool hot well, little guy, whatever it is he starts to put himself in the place of connection and being of service to people and just kind of like in, in the world. And so when he leaves with that cup of coffee, now he's got the coffee hit, right? <laughs> but he also has whatever that emotional thing that is for him that kicks in. Now he's an extrovert. And if you're an introvert, you might be like, oh my God, I would never want to do that. But the point is there's things that we can do or our own life hacks that kind of can get us in the game earlier that day. And for him, that's what he does. Yeah, absolutely. I want to uh, talk to you about uh, iceberg selling and the and the philosophy behind it. So, I guess starting out, where you know where did it come from, and and how did it all come about? Yeah. Um, well, like I said earlier, I've always been in sales, and I've been one of those people that I feel like was lucky enough, even from an earlier age, that I was a top performer. Um, in my early twenties, I was in the financial industry. I go to New York, I get trained, I come back to Colorado and sure enough, like I'm in the top 5%, top 10% all, all this time. And I'm competing against guys that are 35, 45, 50 years old. I'm like, how is this? Why is this? And I think at that point in time, I was naturally building relationships because connection as a little kid 
was so important for me. Like I didn't, I didn't fit in school. So I needed to find other ways to fit. And it was by connecting with other humans. And I think what I realized looking back now as a, as a much older adult is I was taking the time not to talk about the transaction, not to talk about the deal, not to talk about whatever was at the bottom of the funnel, but I was taking time to learn about the person and their world. And um, over the years, as I've either trained people that work for me, as I've had different companies or uh, in my career now, where I have a company where I come in and build sales organizations, I realize that there's so much kind of historic, this is what sales is about. You know, always be closing, bottom of the funnel, what's your closest deal? You know, how much is it going to be? What's your commission? And those are all like outputs. Those are outcomes of, I'm sorry, they're all outcomes of, a, of, of, of doing a great job. They're, they're really not the things that you do immediately. So I think there's this, this kind of like thinking in sales that if you're not talking about the deal and the close, you're not a salesperson. And, and actually, I think that's really incorrect. I think if you're not thinking about how many families do I know and do I get their world and how can I be in their world? And if I'm in their world, how can I be of service? Guess what's going to happen? The outcome of that is going to be they're going to call you when they want to sell their house or buy their house or when their parents move to town or when they decide to buy a house for their, their kids because they're going to go to school nearby or whatever it's going to be. And so for me, it was this journey where again and again, I go into these organizations and I had to change the narrative from the thing, you know, how much money, how much clothes, this, this crazy pressure to, wait a minute, how are we of service? How do we understand people? And what I started to do is I was looking through all these presentations I had given over the last 10 years. And there was a theme. Every couple slides, there'd be an iceberg. And in these conversations, I would be like, look, you know, you're only seeing 10% of their world. How can you solve anything if you only see 10% of it? And then I started to have this aha of like, okay, if I could share the way I've been selling all my life, how I've been coaching people and give it a way that people could remember, like if all you remember from this podcast is everybody, your spouse, your partner, your kids, your next customer, your parents, they're all icebergs. You're an iceberg. We typically only show about 10%, but yet we want to connect like we see all of it. So to me, it was just kind of this easy hack, if you will, of saying, Hey, if I can help people realize, especially in sales, that everything's an iceberg and until we start to see what's below the surface by being curious, we're just not, we're not of service. We're not doing what we really want to do. And that's kind of the short backstory of <laughs> iceberg selling. It just kind of happened. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'd love to kind of dive into what, you know, how people can start to go deeper, I guess. Uh, yeah. on that, you know, kind of the iceberg and kind of get chip away at some of those layers and, and gain some more of that information from their, uh, you know, their potential clients or customers out there. So uh, yeah. what are some of those things to start connecting with your client base? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. And I think what I'm going to do before I talk to you about actually how do you like iceberg sell is um, a couple mindsets that I think will almost create like the table stakes or the muscle memory. Like if we were about to run a marathon or train for it, this is the stretching. This is the like pre-work you do before you do the thing that you're really trying to do. Um, the first one is a lifetime value mindset. And I think all of all of you listening in the, in, the, in the real estate world, you get this, right? You don't want to just sell one house. You want to help them as they go from a young family to a bigger family, to maybe then they downsize or, you know, whatever it is, you want to be in their lives embedded because you care. And you also know that lifetime value is more important than a transaction. And so that's just a reminder. Like if you move your mind from how do I close this immediate deal to how do I work with this family for years, then I think you're going to create a mindset advantage that when you do iceberg sell, people feel it. They know you're really committed about understanding their world. Uh, the second one is being of service. And the example I gave, I was on another podcast and it just popped into my head, but it's super relevant to, to, to our listeners right now. I want you to imagine um, you have a family from out of town coming in and they've decided to work with you to find their house. And uh, you are also a golfer. I just want you to put that out there. You're a golfer. And as you get to know this family, they have a young kid. He's 13 or 14 and he loves golf but they're going to be in the state you live in now for a week and he can't play golf and he's super competitive. He loves it. And it's like a big Porsche, big part of his life. Well, if you know his world, if you know that family's world, you could easily say, Hey, I have some clubs. I'm happy to give them to you. 
why don't we do this? We're going to meet at the club or the local golf course. We're going to let you go, your kids go to the range. And then let's just talk over, you know, an iced tea. Right? That's being of service. It's not just about the deal. It's about understanding that family, the family dynamics, and truly being a guide, being of service, being of somebody that cares. So the first thing I would just want to say is these are two mindsets that you probably already know. You probably said, yeah, I would have done that. I would have given them my golf cl clubs, but think about the people you've worked with in the last year. Have you loaned your golf clubs you know, or whatever that might have been in your world? And if you're like, no, well, then you might be you might be trying to get to the transaction too quickly. And quite frankly, for me and most salespeople, most realtors I know, they want to be of service. They want to help people. That's what puts the smile on their face. So I encourage you to kind of revisit those two mindsets. Um, but with that, I'm happy to kind of explore couple of the steps of iceberg selling, if you want me to jump into that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just he hearing you, hearing a lot of the points that you're bringing up, um, I think, you know, just for me, a lot of it, it really goes back to actually like, really listening to what your customers are, you know, not necessarily customers, but just the people that you're coming yeah. into contact with truly need or truly want, because, you know, if you are doing, you know, if you're always trying to close and you're the one doing the talking, you might not pick up on right. the fact that, hey, this kid really loves to play golf and he can't for the next week. Yeah. And he's stressing out his parents and his parents can't pay attention to you because they're trying to figure out how to, you know, get their kid from being upset. You know, I'll give you an example there. This is a real life example that happened to me. So um, about four years ago, when my oldest son, uh, we were about, you know, actually it must have been three-ish, we were coming out of pandemic. So his freshman year of high school, half of that year, he was remote. Yeah. Sorry, let me rephrase that. His eighth grade year into his freshman year. So it's it's at the end of his eighth grade year, he's found the high school he wants to go to. It's in the county I live in, Boulder County. And I'm looking for a house that summer before his freshman year. Now you got to realize, as we all know, he spent the last half of his eighth grade year not being able to see anybody. And now he wants to go to a new school that none of his friends are going to. This is a big decision for him, okay? So there's this beautiful house. My son happens to be a golfer and um, it backed up to the practice screen of this public golf course. And I was like, oh my God, this is the perfect house. But it wasn't in Boulder County. He wouldn't have been able to go to the high school that he had picked out. So I called the realtor who is a friend of mine and we've known each other for years. That's what was kind of tragic about this. I said, look, please do not tell him it's not in Boulder County. Please do not tell him that it's not the same high school. It will melt him. And she's like, I'm sure there's ways to work around it. I'm like, that's not the point. He's not going to be able to focus on this house if he's really worried that he can't go to the high school he just chose, even though there's a golf green and he loves golf. Okay, Carl, I get it. We drive up. We all have our stupid masks on. <laughs> that's the time it was. And we walk in. And we're about to walk there. And she's out there with the selling agent. And she goes, Carl, great news. Even though it's not in Boulder County. There's a chance he could open and roll. My son turned around and walked into the car. She killed the sale. And the rest of the time, she doesn't know she's done it. She's like, Carl, look at this. Look at the kitchen. Look at this. And your wife and da, da, da. And, and I was so angry because I, she, not only did she not hear me, but now I've got a pissed off kid who's going through COVID and trying to figure out how he's going to you know, navigate his freshman year. So you're right, like so much of iceberg selling, what I'm about to reveal to you is about being present and setting yourself up to be success, repeating what you're hearing. And I'll go through it now yeah. that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. I see you have, uh, you know, your, your five best practices kind of laid out real nicely. I'll knock through them. So the yeah. first one is do your research. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can learn a lot about a family just, just by what you find on social media asking them a couple questions. Where are they moving from? How old are their kids? And you can make some assumptions, right? So one of my favorite stories about doing the research is my father turned 80 this year. And I was thinking about having a surprise party for him. Well, even if I, even if you're just listening right now and be like a surprise party for an 80 year old, what would that look like? Well, first of all, we all know it's not going to be at night, right? He's not <laughs> going to drive somewhere. He's 80 years old and his friends aren't either. It's not going to be at a dark, noisy restaurant right? We can go down the list of all the things that we already know before I even ask my dad and say, hey, where would you want to have a birthday? I already know these things. So I'm just kind of asking you or inviting you to think about when you do the research, what can you learn pretty quickly, right? 
that's kind of how you set yourself up, especially if you're competing against other people that might want to work with this family too. The more you know them before they even open up their mouth and you've done the research, the more advantage you have. Plus, it's being of service to them. The second is when you do meet with somebody, I really like to set myself up, up, up and them for success. What I mean by that is kind of paint a picture. Hey, I know we haven't met yet. Let's go meet at a coffee shop. And you know what I would love to do if we have about an hour, I'm going to buy you your favorite cup of coffee. And then I'd love to hear everything about your life. How did you decide to move here? What are you looking for? You know, what's your life like? If you had a magic wand, what would be your favorite house? And then from there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about how I work with other families like yours and the areas that I recommend and why this is my niche or whatever. And this is what I do. And then from there, let's just kind of get in conversation if we might be able to work together. And when am I again? Next step might be, and if I'm not the right person, guess what? I know other realtors, I'll make an introduction. That way they know when we meet, there's nothing up my sleeve. There's no smoke and mirrors. People like to know where you're going to take them, right? It de-risks anxiety. Um, The third is building rapport. And it gets back to what I said earlier. We're all icebergs. So the more you can share, hey, when I was a parent, you know, when I was a young kid, when I had to move here, you know, this is what I look for when I work with people. What do you look for? Like the, the, the big open-ended questions where you can just be quiet and listen and get curious. And by doing that, you build with this rapport and with rapport comes trust. I think we all know that, but it's about being curious and then being quiet and listening and listening and listening and asking clarifying questions. And I think we all know this. But how often have you been there having that cup of coffee and you're so damn nervous? Maybe you haven't made quota. There's something. And you're like, so uh, how soon do you think you might be moving? You know, blap it out. And so, you know, to me, it's about building rapport and just being patient in the moment. The fourth step is about testing for success. And this is one that I love. It is like probably my favorite part of selling. It's about co-creation where I can kind of do a trial balloon of an idea. Hey, so based on what you told me and the fact that you're Son, we couldn't get them off the driving range. Should we be looking for houses on a golf course? Does that sound right? Well, you know, I don't know if we have the budget for that. Well, there might be some other golf communities a little further out that are are in your price range. Are you open at? Is it more important to be near a golf course or not? Because I heard you say golf was important to your son, but I also said you heard you want to be close to this one school. What do you think? But you're you're testing for success, right? Did I hear you right? And what happens is someone starts to kind of build it together. Oh, actually, well, maybe, yeah, you did hear me. And as we do that, we start to trust that other person more and more because I'm being understood. And when your customers, your clients get understood, then that's when that trust happens and you can guide them. You can start to bring them to what you think is best because you really understand who they are and they're using you for your expertise. And then the last one, this is where people get really uncomfortable. It's a clear next step. And I think this is when someone goes, well, what do you mean? I said, this is when you say, okay, well, based on what we said and what we talked about, should we go look at houses on Saturday? Ooh, did I just push them too hard? Oh, I thought we were all friends. We are friends. And guess what? If you really understand somebody, being of service is helping them move forward, getting that calendar out, asking them right then, should we do this by then? And I'll tell you, I've worked with a lot of uh individuals and even in my own career selling to the big titled people at the big companies. And I would even say, if you're calling the president of a fortune 500 company and you're having a conversation with that person, they still want you to do this. They are so damn busy that if you can take that burden off their plate, tell them a clear path forward, it's going to serve everybody. And that way you're not ghosting people, calling them, Hey, you know, checking in, did I check in? Nobody wants that person. Right. So I really would encourage, you know, in this kind of idea of using iceberg selling is making sure that last one of just getting clear on what we're doing next and getting an agreement. Don't see it as something that is head trash, but seeing it as something that's a gift to that other person. So those are like the five, like I like to say that that's iceberg selling in a nutshell. <laughs> right. Well, and I really like, you know, the, the setting the next steps because I can see so many times where uh, agents might have a, uh, an appointment, whether it's on the buy side or the sell side, um, and, you know, you leave that initial meeting and everything is up in the air. And now it's almost, you know, the the agent is kind of playing that game of, oh, I'm going to wait until they call me. But then right. at the same time, the seller or the buyer is like, well, you know, I guess I'll, I'll wait and see what they have for me. And then a week right. goes by and now, you know, they're off to somebody else. Exactly. And 
I think if you've run a good meeting, if you've done what I said, you did the homework, so you show up and they're like, wow, this person's paying attention. Yeah, I am moving from San Diego. Oh, that's what it was like? That's where you live? That was beautiful. Cool. Okay. Or, you know, um, this next one, you know, this is what I thought we would cover today. Oh, cool. And guess what? I did what I said I was going to do. That's another trust point, right? This guy does what he says he's going to do. And then really was curious about me. These weren't manipulative questions. He truly wanted to understand whatever that is that I, I shared. Uh, and they stayed in that moment and listened. And then when they started to bring solution, they asked me for my opinion and we started to build it together. Man, if you've done that, you have you absolutely should have a next step. Most likely, most likely, and in my experience, that client is going to say, okay, what's next? Because they're ready to go. Um, but yeah, I, I just find that it helps so much to, to paint these simple five steps because I think we all intrinsically know. No one's going, well, Carl, you didn't, you didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. Great. I'm glad. So just put it together, you know, right. step right. by step, make it simple, run a good call. Right. Well, and I think, you know, uh, we always, you know, everybody always talks about building the trust and rapport, but you know, so many people do, if, if you're so focused on the, the end transaction and the end goal, it's very difficult to do that. And you might maybe in the moment you think you're doing it. That's exactly and then when you right. go back and you realize, Oh, I did all the talking in that conversation. That's exactly right. Like I was working with a, a a salesperson in a professional services role. And I said, are you being of service? And he goes, well, yeah. And I go, well, tell me what that would look like. He goes, well, I call him every week and say, if you're ready to go, I'm ready to help you. I'm like, how is that a service? You know, like that, that feels real needy. That feels really like pushy. Like, and, and he, now here's the crazy thing. He thinks he's not being pushy because he's just showing up to see if he can help. You know, a, a different would would clearly be, hey, based on what you told me, um, I found this house on the golf course. It's about to come out and I know it's 30 minutes away. But before you saying no, I just thought, why not call you? Because I keep remembering how the smile on your son's face as he hit, the, hit my driver on that driver range two weeks ago. Right. I'm bringing them something that was relevant to who they were versus just, hey, can I help you? Hey, can I help you? You know. So to me, it is about that human connection. Like we started this interview with, like the more I understand someone, the more you engage that little boy who runs up to you when you drive in that driveway, before you know it, you love that little kid, right? You, you're you like, I can't wait for Jimmy to run out and say, hi, I'm going to show him this thing. Or maybe you even bought him something at Target, a Hot Wheels car. Like you've built a relationship because this person cares and is putting themselves out there. Right. And, you know, so many of the agents that I talk to, when they say that they're the success and the, they felt like a, a you know their career really took off is when they started to get that repeat mm -hmm. and referral business and i feel like by doing these things you are setting yourself up for those clients to become those lifelong you know for that lifelong value to continue to rise michael well said yeah i mean if you think about you know if there's people that care about you and you care about them you are going to send them that holiday card. You are going to invite them to that cocktail party. You are going to, when you're in your little downtown eating dinner and they come by and you're with your friends, you're going to go, Hey, come on over. And your friend's going to go, who's that? Oh, you know, that's Carl. He helped, he helped us buy our house five years ago. That's the relationship I want because it's built on authenticity and caring versus how do I close the next house? How do I get you in the car? How do I, whatever. Um, and it's a slight shift because I think even the person that's trying to get you in that car today, they generally probably got into sales to help people. They just aren't executing it in a way that feels right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For, um, you know, and you, I'm, you gave us the example earlier of the, the gentleman that you met with uh, before you had to catch your flight. But, you know, for some of the people that have, have gone through your training and, and read your books, what are some of those, you know, stories that you've heard that how this has like really transformed their business? Yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, I'm going to tell you a story about, I'm going to call him Bob, <laughs> but his name's not Bob. Uh, he was working, he lives in LA and he was working at a company out of the East Coast. And I was coming in and working with that sales organization to kind of like run their weekly sales meeting at the same time, create accountability, action, and give some level of knowledge. So it's kind of this model where uh, I come in and we're running the team, but we're bringing the team together. We're teaching, but we're also, again, What's the accountability? What did you promise to do? What's stuck? How do we unstick it? So it's kind of like workshop plus sales meeting. 
And um, he was one of these guys that the of service was really hard for him to understand when we were talking. He, he was kind of the guy that was like, well, I call them all the time. Do they need some help? And so I said, in this particular meeting, I go, um, I want you to all pretend you're at a comp, you're going to a conference in Vegas and all of our best customers are going to be there. And I want you to give me a scenario at that conference or whatever around this people of somebody you would meet and what you would say. And I intentionally with, went with him. He was the youngest kind of like least seasoned salesperson. And then I went to the senior partner last and there was about five other people in between. So he goes, Carl. And he's like, all excited. He's like, I'd be at the coffee line and there'd be a person there in their shirt. It would say X, Y, Z company. And I would say, Hey, you work in this industry. And they would say, yeah. And I would say, um, well, who do you use for X, Y, Z service? Because we're really great. And he then vomited his own <laughs> in a elevator pitch. And he was like, that would be my ideal scenario. Nothing of what he said was like wrong academically. Like he, it was the right person or the right message. But it was like he envisioned the right person ready to buy at the immediate time right there at the coffee line. So I go through all the other people and the senior partner gets on and she goes, well, Carl, it would all start in the airplane. I would sit down and it was a very comfortable seat. I would see this person walk in and on their computer bag, it would say X, Y, Z. And I would say, oh, hey, are you going to the conference in Vegas? And they would say, yes. And then I would say, why are you going? How did you start your business? What are you hoping to get out of it? And I haven't said anything about who I am yet, Carl. And after a couple of hours, when we landed, if we were still talking, and if they said, what do you do? Or, well, tell me more about your business. I would say, I'm happy to give you my business card. And if you want to talk further, I would love that. But I've really enjoyed talking to you today. And the power in, in the way that she saw the world was so different. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, I had coached Bob, mm -hmm. my friend Bob. Off and on, and he kept getting better and better and better, but he kept kind of hitting the wall. So I stopped working at that that firm about a year ago. Just my, the contract was over, I delivered everything. And about two months ago, Bob calls me. He goes, Carl, I've moved to a different firm. And I took everything you taught me and I was able to kind of like do it from scratch. And I was able to do it my way, not the way I had to do it over there, but like I took everything. And I told him, he's like, Carl, I'm killing it. Like they've now made me like head of this division. I've got five people reporting for me. I'm making more money than I ever have. I'm, you know, I'm not drinking as much as I used to be. He might still drink a little bit, but he's like, I'm not like, I'm not frustrated and stressed out all the time. Like I actually feel valuable. And I said, that's amazing. He goes, I've told them we need Carl. Can you come into the organization? I'm like, I'm happy to, but like, I really appreciate it. Let me start sending you some books. Let's just get started. And, and he's changed his life. And that was this kind of like huge win for me because, you know, he was already, he was doing well there, but he just wasn't happy. It wasn't working. It was like he had clothes on that didn't fit him. And I feel like what I was able to do is give him the clothing and the tailor and exactly what he wanted. And then he was able to stitch together the suit that really worked for him and it's paying off. So for me, I think I see the change when, when a salesperson, a professional moves from just obsessing about closing and the deal and the money and the commission and goes, you know what, if I put my energy toward building relationships and being of service and co-creating answer uh, solutions and bringing people ideas and always trying to think about like, what could I do to help this person? My business compounds quickly. The, the work I get feels great. I'm not drinking at the end of the day. I'm not frustrated. Like, my family, my relationships are better because I'm putting time into learning about others and myself. So that's what I would say. I, I've seen happen again and again and again. I just love Bob's story because it it was like this huge transformation. Um, and it was a surprise for me. Like he reached out after a year. I hadn't talked to him for a year. And he was like, you changed my life. I was like, okay. It's been a year. That's amazing. Cool. Right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with so many of these these things that you're talking about and, you know, really kind of focusing on why you know, you've gotten into sales and creating these, you know, really, I mean, deep relationships with clients. And I think, you know, the more people that can do that within the real estate industry or like say the car sales industry, the, the better that overall view oh of sales from outside people is going to be as well. Oh my gosh. I'm totally, totally right. Totally right. Like my kids run around and, you know, it's funny. I like I'll overhear them talk or they'll work on a class project and they'll be on a zoom call and they're patterning what I do. Cause you know, they're now in high school. They, 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 all their life, they've known me as this guy. 
and they'll ask questions. Like I can remember my son was running a, like a group on zoom to do a class project. And he was like, well, let's do this. Let's go around and learn everybody's idea and what you want out of this project. I was like, holy cow, who is this kid? <laughs> right. But he's just showing up differently because he's showing up, not the guy that goes, okay, I know what we're going to do team. You know, let's do this. And Bob, you're going to do this. And Sally, you're going to do that. He was like, what, how do you want, how do you want to be? Where do you want to be? What's your idea? And then let's start to bring it together and co-create. I, I was floored. It was amazing. So, yeah, I mean, I think the more we show up like this, whether it's personal lives or in our professions, more there people are going to be like, God, I want to talk to a salesperson, right? Like, I want to talk to somebody that can help me. Um, so, absolutely. I'm, I'm all in on that one. Awesome. Well, where can people that, if they, you know, if they're listening to this, where can they get, uh, you know, Iceberg Selling, but you have uh, several other books and a lot of other resources out there? Excellent. Thank you. Um, the first one is one of the reasons I called it Iceberg Selling is hopefully you remember an iceberg. So I own icebergselling.com. It's a URL just for my book. Uh, you can buy it there. You can buy it through Amazon. It's on Audible. You can even um, send me an email. I'll send you a PDF if you want. If you link up to me on LinkedIn, uh, type in Carl Becker, um, Improving Sales Performance, uh, and you'll find me. My main company is Improving Sales Performance. It has the same URL. So if you want to improve your sales performance, improvingsalesperformance.com. Um, and that talks about the workshops I run, the keynotes I do, the team I have, how we come in and support, whether it's individualized coaching, small team coaching, or building up teams. But ultimately, I would just say, um, go to either of those places. You can track me down. There's links to contacts forms in my LinkedIn. And if you say, yeah, I was on Michael's show. I want to talk to you. I have a question. I would totally take the connection request and, and write you back. And I think you get a kick out of Iceberg Selling. It's, it's a short read. Even if you read two pages at a time, you're going to get it. Audible's two and a half hours. It was a sale book for salespeople written by a salesperson. So yeah. maybe that's enough set. It's going to be fun <laughs> and fast. <laughs> awesome. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us today. And I, you know, for me, I, I feel like the more times, the more people can start uh, instilling some of these philosophies, you know, not only does it make um, you know, their own personal lives better, but, you know, professional lives. And then also there's the industry as a whole uh, gets Absolutely. so much better. I love that you brought that perspective because, you know, I'm not sure I've ever really thought about it in that macro lens, but I think you're right. Like we do amazing things. If you're in any sales role, if you're an agent, real estate, selling professionally, like we solve problems, we help people go to where they want to be. So I, the more you can show up like this and people learn that, yeah, it's only going to raise the entire industry and all your colleagues up too. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us today. Me too. This was a blast. Thank you. I want to thank Carl for joining us today and can really see how implementing the strategies laid out in Iceberg Selling can help real estate professionals build lifelong clients and scalable businesses. Remember, if you'd like to get a copy of Iceberg Selling or connect with Carl, I've included several links in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode. But remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.